Good evening, everyone. It is now 8.02 here on the East Coast, and we certainly want to thank everyone for joining us for American Promises monthly national call. I am Dr. Jessica Hare, your Empowerment Director for American Promise. Um, so in light of recent events at, um, at our nation's capital, I want to open the call with an inspiring and powerful quote from former President uh, Warren G. Harding that reads, Americans, America's present need is not heroics, but healing, not nostrums, but normalcy, not revolution, but restoration. Um, so, um, you know, I, I felt that that quote was very inspiring and empowering, you know, just due to um, different events that ha has happened in our nation's capital. So tonight we have a great lineup, and I am confident that each of you will leave the call feeling empowered to take action. Our guests tonight are Congressman Dean Phillips with Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District and Mindy Finn, the CEO of Citizens Data. Both will be speaking with America Promises President and CEO Jeff Clements. And we will also hear from Azer Cole, American Promises State Manager, and no, I'm sorry, American Promises Political uh, Deputy Director, <laughs> and uh, Marnie Walsh, our Empowerment Coordinator, uh, who will be talking about getting you involved in our March Virtual Lobby Day. So this is not just a conversation, but also a dialogue. We encourage all participants to submit your questions by utilizing the Q&A function located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And so now without further ado, I'm going to I'll turn it over to our president and CEO, Jeff Clements for the American Promise interview with Congressman Dean Phillips. Take it away, Jeff. Great, thank you, Dr. Jessica. And hello to everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're really glad to have you all with us. And, um, I, uh, I just want to make sure I'm not muted. Okay, there we go. Um, so I want to uh, thank uh, Congressman Phillips. We'll be talking with him in just a minute. Um, you've joined our American Promise monthly call tonight. We're a fast growing national network of Americans across the political spectrum and from every walk of life around this country working together to win the next amendment to the US Constitution, one that will empower voters, combat corruption, get candidates and representatives focused on their constituents and the country rather than super PACs and big money. Uh, if you're not already part of American Promise, uh, you came to the right place. Um, you'll hear from our empowerment coordinator, Marnie Walsh, later on and let you know how you can get involved in this national renewal movement. Uh, big thanks to our co-sponsors, Take Back Our Republic, American Sustainable Business Council, Social Venture Circle, and Clean Elections Minnesota. Uh, today, we are celebrating uh, another state victory in Virginia, uh, a resolution just passed the legislature today, um, both houses, uh, commending and supporting this effort uh, of Virginians and all Americans to work across partisan lines to get this constitutional amendment passed and ratified. Uh, 22 states have now taken similar action and uh, that is, this is uh, something that as uh, Congressman um, uh, Jamie Raskin said at our last conference, moving from impossible to inevitable very fast. I wanna share a quote too. I actually wanna share two quotes. Um, I joked with Dr. Jessica, it's the first time Warren G. Harding has made our quotes uh, hit parade, but we always have quotes. And I'm gonna give you two quotes from Congressman Dean Phillips. The first is when he was running in 2018 for Congress. And he said, putting government back to work for the people begins with cleaning up corruption and holding our elected leaders accountable to the highest standards of ethics. The second was from three weeks ago. He said on Twitter from inside the Capitol, the Capitol is being secured and swept. We'll soon return to the house floor, complete our constitutional duty, and then begin the arduous work of reestablishing the foundations of our Republic but we cannot do it alone. We need you, America. Congressman Dean Phillips has represented Minnesota's third congressional district since 2018. Just three years ago, Dean Phillips had not been in politics. He was focused on his business. After working at a variety of startup businesses, he joined his family business, a longstanding Minnesota family business. Phillips Distilling, which he eventually led, went on to build Talenti Gelato into one of the top selling ice cream brands in the country. He's now co-owner of Penny's Coffee, a small business growing fast. 
And as I said, he first ran for office winning a congressional seat in 2018 in the third congressional district in Minnesota. He's a Democrat. No Democrat had won that district since 1961. He soundly defeated the incumbent and was reelected in 2020. He's one of 24 Democrats and 24 Republicans in the Problem Solvers Caucus, an independent member-driven group in Congress with representatives around the country, Democrats and Republicans committed to finding common ground on the big issues facing our country. He is a champion of our work with the constitutional amendment to get big money out of politics. Now HJ Res 1, the We the People Act, HR 1, and so much more. Before we turn to that congressman, uh, welcome again. I wanna start with the Capitol insurrection and your quote you shared with us before turning to the um, reform work moving through Congress. I know people are interested. I know we're all still processing that in many ways, but would you mind sharing your experience? What happened? What does it mean? Where do we go from here? What does it mean for the country and our efforts to bring this country together? Well, thank you, Jeff, and to, to you, to American Promise, uh, to your staff, uh, to everybody joining, uh, heartfelt gratitude. I'm grateful to be with you. I also want to introduce uh, my associate, Damon Effingham, who uh, is on our staff with a singular mission almost, and that is to help us affect government reform uh, and fulfill uh, some of the missions of American Promise. So uh, greetings to all of you uh, and gratitude for uh, your investment in what I consider to be the most important mission uh, on which any of us could be at this time in our history. And, and Jeff, to answer your question about January 6th, uh, truth be told, uh, as I reflect back on it, uh, I still do so with a degree of disbelief uh, that that happened here in our lifetimes, uh, just blocks away from where I'm um, Zooming with you right now. Um, but I got to tell you, I will tell you about the experience, but I will tell you um, in advance uh, that it didn't leave me um, angry. It didn't leave me um, saddened. It left me resolute and it left me recognizing our collective responsibility uh, to, to see that we're fragile. And from that um, comes some inspiration. And I, my hope is that by the end of this evening, uh, you share that inspiration. Uh, we have to look back to understand what happened, but we've got to set our intentions looking forward. Uh, and that day, I will tell you that uh, I walked to work uh, despite being advised not to. When I got to work, there were a few hundred people outside with Trump flags and hats and the like. Um, people were not unkind to me. I didn't advertise that I was a member of Congress, of course, but uh, people were not unkind. And I, my first reaction was this was not going to be as bad of a day as I, we had been warned, actually. We had been warned that it could. I was surprised at how few Capitol Police officers were on the grounds. I was surprised that the only perimeter I could see was a three-foot-tall bicycle rack barricade. I watched the president's speech from my office. I was horrified, as I always had been, from his uh, messages. Um, clearly inciting. Uh, when he said that I'm going to march with you to the, to the Capitol, I knew we were going to see that crowd go from a few hundred to far, far more. Uh, I went to the proceedings uh, to, to bear witness to a historic counting of the Electoral College, uh, which started very peacefully, as you all know. Uh, but my daughters, my daughters sent me some texts showing some video of what was occurring outside of the Capitol. Um, it provoked me. I took my colleague, uh, Tom Alanowski out to the windows outside the chamber to look. What we saw was frightening. Thousands of people now gathered, only a handful of Capitol Police trying to keep them at bay. Uh, we actually found a Capitol Police commander who we see regularly. She promised us all was well, that we're, we are in the safest building in America, if not the world. Exact words. By the time we got back in the House chamber, just minutes later, the Secret Service very physically and abruptly uh, took Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader Hoyer off the floor. Strangely enough, we continued the proceedings. Uh, the Rules Committee Chairman, uh, Jim McGovern, uh, uh, took the chair. And for a few minutes, he continued. Um, but it wasn't long thereafter where a Capitol Police officer took the microphone, uh, screamed, take cover behind a seat or on the ground, get your gas masks on, they're coming down the hall from the rotunda. And I have to say that my first reaction actually wasn't uh, personal fear. It was disbelief uh, and fear for the country to be forthright. Uh, an indelible moment, uh, no question whatsoever. And 
I will say that uh, my second reaction, um, I was sitting with 15 uh, Democratic colleagues on the Democratic side in the gallery. Uh, my second reaction was to go over to the Republican side and try to blend in. Uh, I implored that my colleagues, I screamed actually, you know, come with me, run. A handful did. And I will tell you upon reflection, um, this might surprise all of you, and I don't want to digress, but it's important. Um, I, I've come to realize that uh, we could change the side of the floor of the house we were standing on. Um, but I was with colleagues uh, who could not change the color of their skin. And when I think about privilege, uh, I'll tell you, it left a real indelible mark on me. It will illuminate my service in Congress uh, to the day I die uh, in serving our country because that was my moment. Uh, and a lot happened in that chamber that day. Um, horrific things, um, uh, palpable changes in people, um, and mostly for the better because what we experienced is something that we are now resolute that can never happen again. Uh, and changed a lot of hearts and even minds. Um, we escaped through a side door uh, minutes later to an elevator to the basement through a tunnel where we had to run. Uh, I heard the gunshot as we're getting in the elevator that um, took the life of the woman who was uh, just about to enter the chamber. Um, and it could have been carnage, but um, uh, we live to see another day and we're gonna use the time we have now to ensure it doesn't happen again. Uh, and I ask one more time to recognize we are fragile, uh, we all democracies are, we are not unique, and we all have a responsibility, Jeff, every one of us, uh, to do better, to be participants, not just observers, uh, and to start repairing and rehabilitating uh, some of the foundations of our country. Uh, and that's why I'm grateful to you. Well, thank you, Congressman. I, and that's what we're here to talk about. It's what American Promise, and I think everyone on this call is about we're, we're grateful for the resolute response. And I think many of us are feeling the same way. And when we're talking about rebuilding um, the foundations of our country, and uh, it's, it's really, I think, about um, taking responsibility and giving power to a citizenry that wants to exercise it as people governing ourselves. One of the big things that you've identified when you, since you ran for Congress was the problem of money in politics. Uh, the need for a constitutional amendment to fix that, the need for other big reform. Um, on your website, it's the number one issue you list. Um, you've been uh, motivated, it seems to, to many of us by this issue and a leader in it. Why does this matter so much to you? What, is, what are the, the dots that you connect about this issue that makes it at the top of the list, even in the midst of so many challenges in this country? Jeff, because I believe money is the root cause of why we're in the circumstance right now. I couldn't put it more simply or directly than that. Uh, it has been a long time coming. It has created divisions. Uh, it has amplified misinformation. Uh, it has empowered special interests that care not about the principle or values of those who go to Congress, rather this only the singular issue uh, in which they're investing. Uh, it has depowered uh, Americans and American voters and empowered a very select group of wealthy individuals, wealthy corporations, wealthy institutions, and wealthy special interest groups on both sides of the aisle, by the way. Uh, this is not unique to one party or the other. Um, it is uniquely American. Uh, it is uniquely broken. Uh, and I tell you, as somebody who was on the other side of the table, I was the one that candidates used to come to for their contributions. And I had, I've been disgusted by this game ever since I wrote my first check to a candidate um, some two decades ago. Uh, and it literally appalled me so much that it was in no small part, um, the morning after the 2016 election, my, my, the reaction of my daughters is what most inspired me to do something. I promised them at the breakfast table the morning after the 2016 election that I would do something. Uh, but in no small part driven by my core belief uh, that the money was the basic issue we had to address. Uh, I took on a, a a member of Congress who was the third largest recipient of PAC money in the entire country. It was so evident to me that the money drove the votes, um, not the voters. Um, and I was on a mission to change it. And I'm now the only member of Congress, the only one out of 535 people that refuses to take a dime from any PAC, uh, refuses to take a dime from any federal lobbyist, and refuses to take a dime from any fellow member of Congress. I'm the only one. Now, granted, I'm in a position where in my first election, I could do so. I invested some of my own resources in that election. I won't be doing that moving forward, 
Uh, I'm going to rely on individuals. I want to walk the talk. Um, but I recognize my colleagues have to play by these rules until we can change them. But these colleagues of mine are spending 10,000 hours per week. That's right, 10,000 hours per week raising money. And if you extrapolate that over the course of the year, you understand what is so darn broken in our system. And we reward the people that spend the most time and raise the most money. We don't reward the best ideas, uh, they're the best principles or the best ethics uh, or the best legislators or the best leaders. We reward the biggest fundraisers. And how do we reward them? With leadership positions, with national perches that they can then dictate uh, the directions of parties. And that's where we find ourselves right now. So my, my proposition is really simple. Um, you know, we have got to address Citizens United uh, and I believe, I believe in term limits uh, because I think we need to recycle, um, you know, servant, um, uh, you know, volunteer, uh, public servants, if you will. Uh, and we've got to address the money in politics. Uh, we are doing it incorrectly. We are doing an injustice, I believe, to our constitution, to our founders um, who very much believed. Uh, in fact, George Washington, second, um, his farewell address, I should say, uh, read it because a lot of what he feared relative to the parties he didn't say the money specifically, um, but I think their fear was that we would see exactly what we're seeing right now. And the money is the fuel. So if you cut off the fuel, the reformation comes easily. And that's my mission. Yeah, well, and we're, we're so glad it is. And it's, it's, a, it's a mission of a lot of Americans now. I, I wanna drill in a little bit and see how we can um, move it forward fast. We're on a timetable uh, to ratify this amendment by July 4th, 2026. Um, there's now, as you know, over 200 plus um, House members backing it, um, 50 senators backing it, 22 states. Uh, in the country, as Mindy Finn's going to share with us in a few minutes, overwhelming support, well north of 70 percent across partisan lines. That's not the picture in Congress. So a lot of our work, I think, needs to take on this final big hill of getting your colleagues united, like the country's united about the need to do this. And I, I wanna, we'd love to get your advice, your thoughts, your experience on how we as, uh, as a citizen out here with an American promise can help do that. There are a lot of business people on the call, um, the American Sustainable Business Council, the American Promise National Business Network. You come out of the business world there. It's gonna take everybody, but I have a question about the business folks in particular, given the recent re-examination of many of the larger uh, corporations around wh what their money is doing and where it's going. Um, our amendment, of course, would free them of that and have a level playing field without that kind of money. Are you seeing a greater appetite in the business community for really saying, look, it, we can't just pause this. We have to fix this and getting more business people involved in the American Promise Amendment effort. The answer is yes. Uh, I'm seeing company, in fact, this is a little bit of a separate um, leadership uh, announcement, but I think an important one that illuminates uh, my perspective, which is General Motors today announced that by 2035, they would cease production of gasoline and diesel powered cars and SUVs. An example of a company taking a bold step. We've seen 20 of the 30 largest packs in the country uh, announce that they will not send any money to the 140 or so members of Congress who voted uh, against the certification of Joe Biden's election. We're seeing for the first time, some companies take some pretty bold steps uh, in areas that they had not done before. Um, and I salute those leaders. I, I believe we cannot legislate our way out of this, Jeff. Um, you know, overturning Citizens United with an amendment is gonna be awfully difficult. But I'll tell you, the biggest players have a lot of power. And I think all of us collectively should start encouraging our, our business leaders and nonprofit leaders around the country to uh, start walking the talk. Uh, I think the movement needs um, uh, our version of an inconvenient truth. We need a documentary. We need a movie. We need something that mobilizes the country to point out this glaring problem in a way that makes sense to people. Because if there's anything that unifies uh, kind of Donald Trump supporters and, uh, and the left, it's a belief that their voices are not being heard. And the reason is because of the money. Um, that's a unifying possibility. Um, I have to be forthright, though. Uh, you know, a, an amendment to our Constitution is designed to be very difficult to achieve. You know, two thirds uh, of the House, two thirds of the Senate, and then ratification by three quarters of the states. You know, right now, um, it, it's not promising to be forthright. 
But that doesn't mean we don't keep trying because if we keep pushing and we're relentless and we're resolute uh, and we market it and we expose it and we express it and we illuminate it, we can do it. And that's why I love you all because it's not an easy task. Um, but the biggest changes that this country has ever um, affected uh, came from literally decades, if not generations of work. And we still, in many cases, when it comes to equity, racial equity, economic equity, we still got a lot of work to do. Uh, but I think this is a, an important starting point. In fact, the ERA hasn't been fully ratified yet, but it's possible uh, with the right people, the right leaders, and the right mobilization. And uh, I'm going to work towards that end because we have got to address the fundamental challenge and the fundamental cause of what we're facing right now. And I think the more people that recognize it, uh, the more we'll get on board. Yeah, and there's a couple of questions coming in on, on the, the partisan question. Uh, you know, American Promise is absolutely not only nonpartisan, but cross-partisan. We welcome yeah. Republicans. We welcome Democrats. Yeah. We welcome independents. We are Republicans. We are Democrats. We are independents. Um, and so um, I don't want it misunderstood. There, there's a, a question on this. Um, uh, this this is absolutely uh, something that, as as Congressman Phillips said, we need every American to get behind this. We need two thirds of Congress, three quarters of the states to ratify. My point is, Americans are doing that. Republicans support this. Um, Democrats support this. Independents support this through the roof. The challenge is in Congress. So, I I we have uh, been working um, on trying to uh, appreciate the the challenges of cross-partisan work in Congress in a divided time. And I think money is partly to, to driving some of the extremes. You're in the Problem Solvers Caucus. Uh, it, is it is a two dozen uh, Republicans and two dozen independent or Democrats and determined to stay balanced that way. Um, you know, there's, there, there are Republic, John Katko, a Republican from upstate New York is a lead sponsor of this constitutional amendment. <laughs> Uh, but it's hard to ask a Republican, and it's it's not fair to expect them to walk over and sign on to something that has 220 Democrats when the attack ads are going to come that somehow they're a rhino or other things. So there's a couple of strategies I'd love to bounce off you and see what you think. One, one is a, a, a very good amendment language. It's similar to H, uh, H, what's now House Resolution 1, the constitutional amendment that you've backed and um, Congressman Deutsch and Raskin and Katko and McGovern are, are backing um, and will have a lot of support of Democrats. Um, but it, it would be a little bit different. It would highlight things like federalism that, that are also being damaged by big money as elections are getting nationalized. Um, but we think it could have, and we have talked to Republicans who think it, it has a lot of promise. We're thinking about a strategy like the Problem Solvers Caucus of two or three or four at a time on each side and building so Republicans have a place to go when their constituents tell them as they are, we want you to do something about this. And they don't have to join necessarily the rhetoric of overturned Citizens United or 220 Democrats. They can move it forward and then we'll bring it together. So that's one idea. Um, in your experience with the Problem Solvers Caucus, um, can you work with us on that? Is that, a, is that a viable? We do think like Congressman Gallagher and Fitzpatrick and Katko and others yeah. are ready on the other side to work with a a few like you and Congressman Moulton and others who want to help make that happen. What do you think? I say absolutely, frickin lutely and <laughs> not waste time. And the names you just mentioned are my, they're my brothers uh, on the caucus. This is not a partisan issue. This is not a conservative or liberal issue. This is an issue uh, that is very uniquely American. And I have to say, Jeff, on this subject, uh, things are, there's some, there's been some shifting here in the last literally number of months that actually make this a lot more likely. Uh, one of which is uh, some long-standing, very uh, more conservative-leaning organizations that had almost exclusively contributed to Republicans, uh, like the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the National you know, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. They're starting to support Democrats. Uh, the Republican Party, which had kind of been um, you know, a combination, a, a coalition of a lot of uh, interesting groups, I think you could say, um, including you know, the wealthy and, and, and corporate America, is, large, is becoming a little bit more of a working class party as well. So some of these issues, there's, a, there's some ground shifting that makes this much less uniquely you know, partisan. And also, I will say that HR1, there's a component of it that's really important here, which is the fact that you know, if we could find a way to replace the incessant need to raise money with some public financing, you know, the problem in the past has been that one party always thought that 
any legislation would disadvantage the other side or you know, empower the others at our expense, if you will. But I think the reality is there's a great case to be made right now that if we actually got rid of most of the money, uh, use some public financing that would level the playing field, that would mean that the best candidate, the most efficient use, the most um, innovative use of the funds would win. The key is to not advantage one party or the other. And I think that is at the, you know, that's the, the crucible issue, if you will, that we have to address. And I think on the Problem Solvers Caucus, we recognize that that's absolutely achievable. And to your point, the genesis of this could be at our table. I hope you bring it to us and we start working together because the time is now. Great. Well, we look forward to working and we are going to bring it to you on our Citizen Lobby Day, which we have to turn to now. That's coming up in just Great. a couple of months. Um, I want to share my screen for just a minute as we um, say thank you to Congressman Phillips, who um, you were, as you recall, um, a, a wonderful participant with folks from your district in our last lobby day at the end of 2019 at our National Citizen Leadership Conference. We had 150 meetings with members of Congress across the aisle, uh, people from all over the country. It's going to be remote this year, so you won't be able to uh, do what you do, did last year, but I want to share my screen because it gives great hope for uh, cross uh, divides work as the gelato entrepreneur and the ice cream entrepreneur came together to serve ice cream to citizen lobbyists from around the country. And uh, it was a wonderful day. We thank you for that, uh, Congressman Phillips. That's, of course, uh, Ben Cohen of Ben and Jerry's, everybody, uh, and, and uh, Dean Phillips, once of Talenti Gelato, maybe again of Talenti Gelato after the <laughs> service to the country is done and we are renewed and healed and repaired. Congressman Phillips, thank you for everything. Uh, we're going to let you go, bring it over to Azer Cole our National Deputy Field Director to tell us more about Lobby Day. But thank you so much. Let us know how we can help this effort in Congress. And we really appreciate you being with us tonight. Well, Jeff, thank you. And to your associates at American Promise, uh, to all of you on the Zoom tonight, uh, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, a Libertarian, Independent, I love you all. And I particularly love you uh, if you will join us on this mission to expose the problem of money in politics and uh, help walk down the path together uh, to fix it. Because if we do, uh, our legacy will have been the repair of the country at a time we need it more than anything else. So Godspeed everybody and thank you. Thank you, sir. Azer Cole, take it away. Great, well, thank you, Jeff. Thank, thank you, Congressman Phillips. We'll, we'll miss scooping ice cream with you in person at this lobby day coming up that we'll do virtual, but maybe we'll do some virtual ice cream celebrating um, I'm sure we can make something like that happen. And thank you, Damon, for being here as, as well, and, and Mindy and, and everyone on the call listening in. And I'm excited to talk to you really about my favorite thing at American Promise, and that's our Citizen Lobby Day. Um, you know, make no doubt about it, like, like what Congressman Phillips said, constitutional amendments are hard and they're supposed to be. And that's exactly why we need to work together to get this done. It's that simple, organizing, educating, taking direct action with our members of Congress is how we do this. And Citizen Lobby Day is our yearly mass action to move this amendment powerfully forward. We won't be doing an in-person Lobby Day this year, um, but I'm excited to announce that this year's digital Citizen Lobby Days will be May, May 4th through 6th. That's a Tuesday, a Wednesday, and a Thursday. And I hope that everyone on this call signs up to participate. So. What does it mean to participate in Citizen Lobby Day? Well, if you sign up, myself or Marnie there in, on your screen at American Promise will reach out to you. And Marnie's actually gonna share her screen right now to show you how you can register right now, e easily on this call through the American Promise website. And you can just sort of follow along as I talk. And we'll also send this in the follow-up email afterwards. And there'll be a lot coming out from American Promise about Lobby Day and, and the entire National Citizen Leadership Conference in general. But you can see that Marnie's on um, the American Promise website and she's gone up to the top there under conference and clicked on Citizen Lobby Day. And you can see as we scroll down, if you scroll down Marnie, you'll see, uh, if you just go back for one second on that slideshow and you'll see another one of, of Congressman Phillips scoop and ice cream. But it's, it's easy to sign up, so, so please do check it out while we're on this call or, or directly after. And once you do sign up to participate, 
um, will connect you with other people in your area. Um, you won't be doing this alone and you won't be going in unprepared. Uh, American Promise gives you the tools and the guidance to schedule and prepare for effective meetings with your members of Congress. And you might choose to be the point person who schedules these meetings, or there might be someone else in your state or your district who takes this role on. So between now and May 4th, American Promise will be holding three citizen lobby trainings. The, the first one is gonna be on February 24th. Um, there'll be a follow-up in March and a follow-up in April. And they'll all be recorded and we'll include a registration link to the first one in tomorrow's recap email. Um, and, and really every step of the way, our job is to support you and, and connect you with others in your area doing this same thing. And just to give you some quick context, last year, you all in the National American Promise community had over 130 meetings with members of Congress and their staff. Uh, tons of people were doing this for the first time. And, and there's really just something profoundly powerful and important about participating in democracy. And everyone on this call who's sat in their member of Congress's office knows the incredible feeling of being prepared and professional, moving this amendment forward one meeting at a time. So, so please do register. Even if you want to just learn more, register. It's free and we'll follow up with additional instructions, registration links for trainings, everything you'll need. But the first step really is filling out that form that Marnie is showing you right now. And Marnie, if you could just put the link to that page in the chat right now, that would be fantastic. Because in my opinion, this really is our most exciting action of the year. And I, I can't wait to work with you all to make this year's Citizen Lobby Days our best yet. So I'm going to kick it back to Jeff now to continue the call. Thanks, Jeff. There we go. Thanks, Azer. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you, Marnie, who you'll hear from in just a minute. Do stick around uh, for more from Marnie on Citizen Lobby Day and how you can sign the Citizen Pledge as well. Um, so I want to now bring into the conversation uh, my friend, Mindy Finn. Um, and Mindy uh, is with us, I believe. Let me just make sure she's with us. Yes. I'm here. Yes. Okay, Fair Mindy, enough. great. There you are. Thank you. I just want to say a few words uh, about you, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Mindy Finn is the CEO of Citizen Data. Uh, it's a nonpartisan data analytic startup that serves the public interest. She's the founder of Stand Up Republic, a founding member of Reflect Us. She's worked at the highest levels of politics, media, technology for two decades, leading digital programs for President George W. Bush, Mitt Romney, as well as dozens of successful political candidates and causes through her first successful company, Engage, which she sold in 2011. Uh, Mindy's expertise on catalyzing tech-fueled movements garnered profiles in publications such as Washington Post, National Journal, Politico, Glamour, and resulted in roles with Google, Twitter, Medium, and Change.org. She ran as an independent vice presidential candidate alongside Evan McMullen in a ticket that garnered a record number of national write-in votes and 21% 21.5% of the, she's a data person, I got to get the 21.5% of the vote in Utah in 2016. Originally from Houston, Texas, Mindy and her husband are the proud parents of three children who inspire them to work with increased vigor to leave America better off. Uh, she has been called in the Houston Chronicle. Uh, at every turn in her career, she's been looking around the corner to identify and help build the next big thing we are so proud to be part of the next big thing and very glad to have our friend Mindy Finn on the call today to share some interesting data from around the country. Thank you, Mindy, please take it away. Absolutely, thank you so much, Jeff and the American Promise team. It, it really is a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to, to work with your team. Um, you know, I, I think I need your, your writers as my PR people, because um, that was quite an introduction, but, you know, to pick up on that in terms of the next big thing, um, if we're to look around the corner, what is that? To, to me, that is, we, we just have to, to fix our democracy. Um, and, you know, our, our nation is, is too divided. It's going further to the extremes. And it's, it's not because the American people are, you know, bad or wrong, but it's just the incentives 
are really perverted and the incentives um, incentivize, you know, fear-based politics, tearing down the other side. And it's because there's a lot of money to be had by that through the media and through politics, not to mention, you know, all the things I've seen firsthand in my political career, which is just as, as Congressman Phillips said, the amount of time that members of Congress spend to fundraising, the obsession that it becomes um, where, you know, and then they get to, they get to office and essentially they're getting paid to go raise money. Um, you know, that becomes their job. Uh, and so, you know, now these days as, you know, Citizen Data, as you mentioned, is a data analytics startup. We work with the community of organizations. Our focus is to support the community of organizations that are uh, fixing the, the root causes and, and what ails our, our democracy in a, in a nonpartisan and a cross-partisan way, because we truly believe that in order for these reforms to be sustainable, you know, they, they, they really, they need to be cross-partisan or they, they should be cross-partisan. Um, and as we'll see in a moment, as we go into the data, um, you know, dissatisfaction is not partisan. It transcends partisan lines. The, the public is aware across parties and they, they feel it viscerally that their leaders are not responsive to them in the way that they should be. And they're not focused on the problems and getting stuff done in the way that they should be. So with that, I will dive into just some, uh, some of the data from recent surveys that we've done around reducing the influence of money in politics on you know, the, the potential for a 28th Amendment and support for, for that measure. I'm going to share my screen. Mind. So, you know, I'll get kind of right to the to the punchline. You know, they they say in, in journalism, show show don't tell, but I'll, I'll just tell you the the punchline off the bat and, and do the opposite, which is as much as we hear today and we see the uh, effects of a divided, you know, country, um, the the events of January 6th at the Capitol that Congressman Phillips spoke about, um, America is united on some on a few things. And one of those things that the American electorate is united, united on is the role of money in politics. And that money in politics is a big problem and that less money in the system would make it better. Um, a week before the inauguration, we did a national survey, not for any specific group, but really just a state of play survey. It's such a, a pivotal time in our country. And one of the things that we tested was a series of changes and reforms and ask voters whether they thought they would make it better or worse, make our politics better or worse. Um, and I'll just say, you know, the environment is right for the 28th Amendment. I'm sure a lot of you know that you do this work. But, you know, when you look at the numbers, it becomes really clear that, um, you know, if the voters were in charge, this would be done tomorrow. We asked, you know, whether less money in politics would make politics better or worse and 69%, you know, overwhelming number so that it would make, make it better. And this transcends partisan lines. Um, and if you add in those who kind of don't know or need to learn more or neutral, it's, it's almost 100%. And I will say we tested actually a bunch of other things of which you know, Citizen Data, my, my company, works on uh, with organizations, things like redistricting reform, things like you know, nonpartisan primaries. Um, you know, overwhelmingly, less money in politics is the issue that, that voters point to and for which there is cross-partisan support beyond kind of any, any of those other issues. As I mentioned, the support, um, this is you know, actually testing support for um, the, the 28th Amendment. It transcends partisan lines. Uh, you can see that while there are you know, more liberals and more, more Democrats that support it slightly more than, than independents and Republicans, or if we're looking at ideology, more liberals than moderates or conservatives, um, it's 67% of Republicans support it, 68% of conservatives are working, looking at it ideologically. There's very little difference uh, among people ideologically or by party in their support level for this. In the last few months uh, with American Promise, we have tested support for the amendment in particular states, and we've gone more into detail, and obviously testing support for the amendment itself, but also testing various message points, like you know, educating, 
because for some people, there are still people who don't know enough. And, um, and so it's important to make sure that they learn kind of the implications, both positive or, you know, maybe negative. I think for this group, you don't see any negative ones, but, you know, some people do attack this measure and it's important to understand how voters respond to that. Um, just on its own, when we ask about support for, for the amendment, you can just see it here, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious. And this is Ohio, Maine, Pennsylvania. We did test them at different times, but in, in all of these places, just there is you know, over 64% support is the, was the floor in Ohio with you know, Maine at 73% um, and just very little uh, opposition to this measure. Um, you, know, you, you have to wonder kind of those who oppose, you, you know, I think one of the things to do in the future is maybe to dig in a little more of that, but um, you know, there's always gonna be some percentage of the public that opposes, but there is overwhelming support here. Uh, I'll just zoom into Pennsylvania for a second. Pennsylvania, we actually tested after the election, some of these other states before the election. I think as we all know, Pennsylvania had a few things going on <laughs> in this election. It was a swing state. Um, there was a lot of controversy about the counting of its mail ballots and, and obviously its results were challenged by Donald Trump's team and Republicans. Um, and, and so voters, you know, there were really experiencing this, this information storm about kind of the integrity of, of politics, you know, and, and point, pointed, pointed at, the, at their state. The focus was really pointed at, at their state as well as a couple others. Um, so we, we tested there and, you know, overwhelming, you know, support, as you can see, is the, is the theme was particularly strong. Those who identify as nonpartisan, 79% supported the amendment, 68% of Republicans. Um, just briefly, you know, this also is true across age and, and across uh, education level. You know, would note there's a slightly, you know, higher level of support among those with a college degree and a slightly, you know, less support for those over 65. Um, but, you know, the trends in the country among those under 65 and as more people are getting a college degree, you know, in those cohorts, there's even more overwhelming, you know, support than the baseline. Um, and just to touch kind of briefly, as I said before, we did test, you know, some of, some of the key benefits and ask voters, you know, once they heard them, did that make them more or less likely to support, as well as some of the, um, you know, attacks that those who don't want to pass this may levy against it. And even once voters heard both of those things, and there was randomization going on to, um, to, to control for kind of question order bias, you still had um, you know, these high levels of over 70% or over 65% support, um, support stayed pretty, pretty steady, which is really, really incredible. This is a, um, in some ways, a, in, you know, impenetrable policy and in advocacy, that's fairly difficult. I mean, there's most things that, um, you know, if you levy enough attacks at it, people will, will start to uh, back, back off. But in this case, that does not appear to be what's happening. Um, a couple of those just positive points, you can see them here, that it would allow elected officials to focus on serving their constituents instead of fundraising, that it could prevent the undue influence of special, special interest. You can see that even though you started a very high baseline, once voters hear these messages, support grew uh, 10% you know, after hearing these messages even. So um, you know, this is, you know, as you go into your lobby day, I'm sure these are the kinds of messages that you're using um, in talking to legislatures, or certainly these are those that you use to talk to your members and to, to citizens to get them motivated to get involved. So I will stop there. Well, thank you, Mindy. That, that, that was wonderful. Um, we, we have questions coming in on the, uh, on the, on the Q&A, but um, uh, Marty or anyone on the team, uh, have a question for Mindy and otherwise I'll jump in with uh, sure. some of them. Go ahead. Yeah, Mindy. I have a question. Um, Mindy, thank you for your presentation. Um, how can I best, so I guess like when having a conversation with family and friends, how can I best articulate this data to them? <clears throat> Just to clarify the question, the status of the amendment or of the data? Yeah. The data. The status. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, we know that uh, persuasion, there's this bandwagon effect that once people hear that an overwhelming percent of the, the nation, of their neighbors support something, they're more likely to do so. If it's a Republican family member or, or friend, you know, basically trying saying that, 
more than two thirds of Republican voters believe that we should have a 28th amendment to limit, limit the influence of money in politics. Um, you know, I think that really helps people like to hear that those that are like them support this, that makes them comfortable. Um, I would say the other thing though, that's most important, kind of depending on the audience, uh, the, we did use kind of some messages where we would say nonpartisan versus actually suggesting, say, to Democrats that it would limit, you know, it would, it would sort of limit the power of Republicans or to Republicans, it would limit the power of Democrats. For both Republicans and Democrats, uh, the idea that this is nonpartisan is really compelling. Um, there, you know, even if you're a partisan, even partisans are often tired of partisanship. And so when they hear about reforms to our system, you know, a way to make our democracy healthier and, and make our, our government more functional. They, they're wary sometimes of things, you know, I think this is especially true for Republicans, if they think it's just something that's going to give an advantage to Democrats, like that, that's the motivation. But if you talk about it as a nonpartisan measure with support from Republicans, Democrats, and independents, and again, if it's a Republican, then to underline, you know, even two, th you know, two thirds of Republicans, Republican voters across the country support this measure, um, that, that, that's, that's really compelling. You know, it really has that kind of bandwagon effect, but also really neutralizes any concerns that they have about this being partisan. Thank you. Great. Um, I, I'm gonna bring in a couple of questions uh, that, uh, thanks Marty, off the Q&A that uh, I've seen as, as themes. Um, so one is, um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around polls uh, and the accuracy thereof from the last election and other times. And I know we have done several states over different times with different data sets. Um, but I, I wonder if, Mindy, you could share a little bit about um, the methodology and, um, and, and there's a lot of questions about how could, these slides are great, how do we get them? We will share this with, the, uh, with all of you in the follow-up email. Uh, Dr. Jessica and, and Azer and Marty, if we could, well, let's add a link to the deck so people can have these slides for themselves. But just, um, it's, it's sort of a follow-up to Marty's question, because when, when uh, the Thanksgiving table relative says, oh, but those are polls, that does, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, and the sort of cynicism about it, what do you say? Yeah. Um, you know, I think you start to ask them their opinion kind of about, about the problem. Are they satisfied with um, Congress? Are they satisfied with their elected leaders? Do they think that uh, we're going in the right direction? I think that uh, you can count on that, you know, much more likely than not, they're going to say no. You know, we kind of outside of this research at Citizen have done a lot of research about the uh, number of American voters who are dissatisfied, and it is, it is the majority. And so I think when you start to ask them these questions, you know, or did you know, you know, use your own talking points. Frankly, this isn't, you know, my, you know, data, but your own talking points about the amount of hours that members of Congress spend fundraising per week um, instead, of, instead of serving their constituents. Once you do that, then, you know, if, they, if you get to the point where they say, oh, you know, that's really outrageous, which I, you know, I think that most of them will, you, then you talk about your solution. And if it's a Republican, again, I, I do, you know, see this um, both in our data and, and you know, anecdotally, they, they might say, oh, but is that something that, you know, this is just a democratic thing. You, you say that this is supported by Republicans, Democrats and independents by a strong majority. Um, and you, you emphasize that over two thirds of Republicans support it. So, so I, I mean, I, I think that that just works pretty much every time. In terms of polls, it's a good question because, you know, we're a data analytics company. Um, we actually do approach our uh, you know, polling has been around for a long time and um, it is, you know, in some ways it is getting more sophisticated and better and in other ways there's new new challenges, you know, with, with polling. But we actually, and I don't need to get, you know, I don't, I won't go into every detail, but um, we, um, you know, we try to iterate and improve all the, all the time too. Um, but, you know, our, our research actually is a combination of your typical survey research, and then and also a predictive predictive modeling, um, and doing kind of re regression an analysis. Um, we do do random sampling. Uh, one way that we kind of try to, to do better than than you know most, um, but there's a, you know a lot of good researchers out there, 
is we maintain our own copy of the voter file that's regularly refreshed um, from the data that comes into the states um, so that it is the most kind of up to date. So when we pull a random representative sample of likely voters or registered voters, it is most up to date. We're not going out to a vendor for that. Um, the other thing that allows us to do is that when we do research, you know, on any kind of democracy issue, um, we can positive ID people. So we know that this person was supportive of this reform, you know, which might have been like redistricting reform, and this person was, you know, not supportive of that. Um, and so it just we build layered insights on top of our our data set just to to make sure that you know it's always fully representative and that we're using each you know survey to to learn more about about every single every single voter. Um, I think the real there's a couple of big challenges in polling. I don't want to get you know, too too much into to these weeds, but I'll just comment, which is you know certain populations it's difficult to reach because. Um, you know, for different reasons. They're, they're more off the grid, they're purposely off the grid, they're not sharing contact information, they're, they don't trust uh, researchers and surveyors that, that call. You can get around that a bit by doing multimodal polls, so a combination of live phone call and text and, and, um, and cell phone, and we do that, we do multi, you know, multimodal polls. Um, so that, that's one way. Um, the other way is just bad data, uh, which is people that are kind of just keep calling the same list and the same list, and so they're surveying the same voters, and the, and they're not hit, hitting others. Um, for that latter problem, you know, by have, maintaining our own file, we we get around that because we can kind of randomize and make sure we're not just kind of reaching the same people all the time. Um, you know, the same kind of people that are reliably answering polls. Um, but for the problem of reaching hard to reach populations, that is one that re maintain you know remains difficult. Um, and it's one that, you know, we really committed just, you know, as a company to, to try to um, lead the field, you know, we're, we're small and we're new, but eventually lead the field because we want to make sure that all voices are, are representative, you know, indigenous populations um, and a lot of, you know, voters whose voices just are, are not as represented in the process. Right. Well, Mindy, we're so grateful. We're going to have to leave it there, but we'll hope you'll have come back on a future monthly call uh, with more states polled and more data. Um, and we're so glad you were able to be with us tonight. Um, we will be sharing this information with everybody um, and hope uh, we'll see you again soon. But we're going to have to let you go and kick it back to Marnie for our lobby day and other empowerment work. But thank you, Mindy thank Finn. You really so appreciate it. Take care. Marnie. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jeff and Mindy. I just want to circle back about Citizen Lobby Day. So make sure you sign up for Lobby Day. It's a great way to be empowered and make a difference in our democracy. I'll post the link up in the chat. Feel free to email myself or Azer Cole if you have any questions. Another thing, I'm just going to touch a little bit about the empowerment department. So I've been about, I've been at AP for about four months now, and it's been such a great experience. Um, my favorite part of working at American Promise is definitely working with the chapter leaders and the other volunteers. Um, they're super empowering and they're always motivating myself and other people across their chapter. If you have any questions regarding chapter involvement, please e email me at marniew at americanpromise.net. And the second call for action in the empowerment department is to sign the citizens pledge and get involved in lobby day. I'll put the Citizens Pledge and again the Lobby Day link in the chat. So the pledge is highlighting your support of the 28th Amendment. You also have the option to start volunteering and or receive informational emails regarding progress and actions occurring in your state. Thank you all. Great. Well, thank you, Marty. Uh, and that's, that's wonderful. Um, so the link is in the chat, uh, and um, did you do the citizen pledge already too? Yep. Great. So um, there have been a lot of uh, questions about how people can get involved. That is the way, right? It's sign up, um, click on uh, join us. Um, we are again very grateful to have um, everybody who has. Uh, been here uh, with us uh, today and our co-sponsors. And um, so uh, it looks like, do we have any other questions, Marty, that you want to pick up? We have, nope. a couple, we have a couple minutes left. 
we never wrap early. We can't do that. We're going to have to bring Mindy back on for all these, all the questions we weren't able to get to then. Uh, I'm kidding. Listen, there's been a, it's been a wonderful call. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. Uh, that we uh, will follow up. Please do sign up uh, at the chat. Our conference is uh, coming up in uh, the spring. Uh, it looks like it's the beginning of May as, and the lobby day is just a wonderful way to do it. But by signing the citizen pledge, uh, many of you are already involved in chapters as Marty said, but um, for those who aren't, that's the place to start because then you can connect up with efforts in your state. It is cross-partisan. It is supported by uh, almost everybody. And so it's just a wonderful way to really do something big and healing uh, to move this country forward. So thank you everybody. Um, and Marty and Dr. Jessica and Azer, thanks to all of you. Thanks to Zai Allen, our communications coordinator behind the scenes at the controls, making it all work. And Mindy, once again, big thanks to you. And of course, to Congressman Phillips and to everybody on this call. Uh, we'll get a recording out to the uh, everybody too. I see our friend and chapter leader in New Mexico, Ashwari, saying, get this recording out. She's going to share it with lots of others. And we will sure do that. So thanks to everybody. Have a wonderful night.